Hey everybody, thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Double E's Talk Tech. We're going to be talking about dispersed computing and how it's going to lead to the AI revolution that will take over your life. My name is Mike Hoffman. And I'm co-host Daniel Bogdanoff. And our guest today is Brig AC. Brig AC manages the strategic planning organization for the Internet Infrastructure Team. He started with Agilent slash Keysight Technologies in 2005 as a technical support engineer. He's been with Keysight for over 12 years. Uh, he's had a number of jobs since then. And um, previously to Agilent, Brig worked at Micron Technologies. He graduated with a MBA from Northwestern Nazarene Univers University and a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from the University of Wyoming. He's also widely published. So Brig, what are you here to talk about today? So I'm here to talk about, about, I don't know, six months or so ago, maybe a little bit longer, Intel purchased a company which was called Altera. Um, Altera makes FPGAs uh, in, that go inside of different devices. And what's happening now is if you look at that acquisition from Intel and just looking at the technology, what you see is Intel has been known for microprocessors for a long time. And then they purchased this FPGA company. And so there's a whole new revolution around how fast the processing is going around for the different technologies. And so that's what I'm here to talk about. Interesting. And what we've described it as is dispersed computing. Can you maybe explain what that means as opposed to non-dispersed computing? What, what would the other word be? Sure. So if you look, uh, dispersed computing is a, a good way to say it because what you're seeing is... Uh, a long time ago, the microprocessor would take on most of the computing, and then you might have a few chips around that would uh, do a little bit of the work, but the microprocessor, for the most part, could handle all of the computing that needed to be done. So then, uh, a while ago, they, were, they decided to add GPUs in, which were graphics processing units, uh, into the, and basically into the design of these different, um, you know, into the design of these different boards. And those worked for a little bit, but it turns out now as the speeds are need to be faster and faster, we need to be able to offload a little bit more off the microprocessor. And so what we're doing is we're dispersing the computing and putting it into different chips. And one of those main chips could be an, it could be an FPGA. Okay. Um, traditionally, you know, we talk about ASICs a lot here at Keysight. We have our own ASIC center and design folks. Uh, could you maybe describe benefits of an ASIC over an FPGA or how is that you know manifesting itself in dispersed computing? Yeah sure so um, we do in, inside of Keysight we do do a lot of um, custom ASICs and ASICs are amazing for doing one or two or ten or twenty tasks really really well um, but the problem that you run into with ASICs is they're super fast at those one or two or twenty ta uh, or tasks that they do really well but where they run into problems is if you need any kind of flexibility outside of those very specific tasks, uh, programming a new ASIC to do those different tasks becomes really difficult. Um, on the other end of it, you have the FPGA, uh, which maybe not quite as fast as a custom ASIC would be, um, but still pretty fast and then completely reprogrammable. So you get a lot more flexibility with an FPGA than what you would with a custom ASIC. So um, I'll just, I'll add one more little thing. So if you look like where we actually use a combination in our, in our instruments, we'll use an FPGA and a, and a custom ASIC. The custom ASICs for very specific tasks that we know we're gonna do over and over again without a lot of change to it. Um, the FPGAs are what we go in and, and change fr fairly frequently in our instruments. Interesting. So microprocessors traditionally are parallel chips and there's a lot of lines coming in, a lot of lines going out and we saw like in the 80s and maybe even the early 90s, um, a huge number of logic analyzers going out the door, and now we're seeing more oscilloscopes going out the door. Is there is that a shift in parallel to serial buses, and are we going back to that multi-lane type analysis or and communication systems, or are we still seeing kind of that serial uh, protocol transmission, I, I guess? <laughs> So, uh, you know, there's an argument whether you're seeing uh, an increase in parallelism. PCI Express has gone to by 16. Um, you've had some other technologies that are going beyond by four and by two, or beyond two and four lanes into 16 lanes. What's happening, though, is because of the, the sheer speed of these technologies, um, think about PCI Express Gen 4 running at 16 gigabits per, uh, per second, you end up with a lot more crosstalk and it's a lot more difficult to be able to go and do these parallel lanes. And so um, there's always the desire to do more lanes because you get more throughput uh, at the same technology speed, but there's a lot of difficulties to expanding expanding the amount of lanes. And so 
uh, t- to answer the question, yes, there is <laughs> there is a move to more parallelism, but we're still seeing um, just your typical you know by two by four lanes uh, still dominate in the technology. Now, um, just to to add on to that, the one thing that you are seeing though that's a little bit different is before we've had a lot of the same players as far as technology goes. So you'd have your your PCI Express, your USB, um, you'd have a little bit of some of the certies, your fiber channels and those kind of technologies, and those would dominate uh, a lot of the, the interconnect technology. Um, now what you're seeing though is because you have the technologies that are hooking between the processor and the FPGA or the GPUs or whatever it is that, that's there, you need these speeds to be much, much faster. And, and not only faster, but they got to be more flexible. So um, what happens is some of the technologies that we're used to tend to be a little bit more slow and they have a lot of overhead in getting to market. Um, so what's happening is new technologies are emerging that are designed to get to market faster and be, be faster in general. And a couple of these that just to, to give you an idea, there's a, a, a Generation Z. Which is, read by, which is led by a couple different companies. And then there's a new bus, which uh, is, is really interesting, which is called the C6 bus, CCIX, uh, that, that also is designed to be very fast to market, um, but also provide the speeds that are needed to be able to connect the technologies. I just have to say that Generation Z sounds, sounds, sounds like some sort of zombie movie. So what, <laughs> what is that specifically? It's just kind of like a PCI Express style standard? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so basically, these, these different technologies are building upon what PCI Express has done for years. And PCI Express is going to continue, uh, but companies, and, and there isn't anything that's really confidential here, but companies such as AMD, Xilinx, uh, and uh, NVIDIA, all are looking for faster ways to get to market with, with chips. And so uh, they're going out and they're developing new, uh, new technologies and developing consortiums to be able to go and share these technologies. And so those are just, uh, just a couple technologies that are, are under development. Is there anything specific about these protocols that will help engineers get devices to market faster? Is it, you know, like a drop-in chip that people are going to be buying IP for, or what, is, what does that look like? Yeah, so um, to get to market to faster, there, or to get to market faster, there's a couple of big advantages of these new uh, technologies. At least this is what they're pitching, right? Um, at the end of the day, we, they, nothing's shipped yet. And so we don't know for sure whether the dream of what the technologies are pitching and what they actually come to is, is what actually happens. But the goal here is, number one, is for these technologies to be uh, more open. And so um, have them be a little less stringent. Uh, if you look at like PCI Express, and I'm not, uh, I don't mean to, you know, to sound like I'm, I'm dissing on PCI Express. That's <laughs> not my intent. But if you look at PCI Express, the, just to test it, and to get it to market, there's uh, literally hours and hours of testing. Um, on top of that, in order to get it to be a standard that actually is shippable, there's months and years of, of time put together to be able to get that to, hey, this is our shippable product. Um, the goal of these new standards is, number one, is to, again, not have all the overhead of a, a big, huge consortium. So for customers, their benefit is they can be, they can be working on these new buses faster at a, a faster speeds. And then the second one is to, to be a little more open in the technology, like you described, is to be able to drop the chip in and have it work. Um, that's, you know, that would be the ultimate goal for these technologies to be able to go and do. Okay. Because so I know we're seeing a lot of, and we won't hang on PCI Express for too long, we're seeing a lot of uh, consumer devices with, for example, one lane of PCIe Gen 2, just because the data transfer is sufficient and it's a pretty easy spec for people to implement at this point because it's been around as long as it's been around. Um, so it sounds like what you're saying is these new buses are going to start to fill in, you know, that type of application. Yeah. And you could see, um, if you, if you look at like consumer devices and what's on the outside of consumer devices, um, you're probably not going to see like a, a CCIX bus hanging off the consumer device for quite some time, but where this really gets important for your cut, co- for, for our customers and for, um, for different people around the world is connecting again that that microprocessor and those other chips that hang around it because in there that's where that's where most of our speed improvement is and so that's where we need to drive technology faster and so that's where these buses are really becoming important and and that's why these companies are trying to drive them to market as quick as possible because they see they have the need to be faster more flexible and they're trying to get there and so again, you, you know, you can kind of look at it as, um, and here's another, here's another one, another technology. Um, you can look at it as like Thunderbolt, uh, which has been around for a long time. 
Um, but the consumer demand for the most part on Thunderbolt has been limited to one or two devices. You haven't seen it in broad PCs and things like that. Right. Yeah. Um, now what you're seeing is finally the, the speed of Thunderbolt has become needed by the consumer. And so what was an internal bus now is starting to find itself more and more on, on um, external consumer-based devices. Interesting. Okay. So I was going to ask a, a quick question to kind of get back to the idea of, of the physical nature of the dispersed computing and talking about offloading the processor into FPGAs. I think the classic example that you mentioned is the graphics processing unit or GPU. What are some other uh, major tasks? I'm sure there's a tons of dispersed computing already, but you know, it, what's kind of the, the big block that might be getting offloaded next that would be similar to a, a graphics card? That's actually a really good question. Um, I know it's surprising <laughs> for you to be asking that question. Ouch. <laughs> Just I, know, I was like, wow. My gosh. Am I allowed to uh, am I allowed to make fun of Hoffman in here? <laughs> a little like, bit, but I make fun of myself all the time. Join join the party. Just to answer <laughs> the question, please. <laughs> so, uh, if you look, uh, you mentioned at the very beginning artificial intelligence, mm. right? And so you think about these machines learning from themselves and 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 creating new processing and and things like that. Well, the reality is is if you look at just your microprocessor, there's no way a microprocessor, if true artificial intelligence happens, there's no way a microprocessor can do it all. They got to be able to go and get some different computing uh, from different resources. And so that's, that's one of the big things is you're getting out of just graphics, just displaying graphics and helping with that into actually doing specific processing for artificial intelligence. Um, another thing that you could see is there's a huge push into analytics, right? So big data is, is starting to come everywhere. Uh, you know, just there's different websites we all went to during the election and we said, hey, what's going on? What's the prediction that so-and-so is going to win or so-and-so is going to win? And that's all driven. The computing behind that analytics is massive. And so, again, a, a processor and a server is not going to be able to just handle all that processing that happens. And so now you have these FPGAs or, or GPUs or whatever that chip is behind it that are going and helping the processor to be able to go in and do this major computing that they maybe haven't done in the past like they're doing now. So is it too much data? Is it, yeah. you know, their processors aren't set up to handle, you know, large scale quantities of data like that in an efficient way? Or is it something else that yeah. makes them unable to do it? Yeah, it's, it's the sheer volume of data. So um, you think about it, number one is we demand that our data become immediately. If I'm sitting on an analytics project and I want to know, uh, you know, I want to know what the chances are that uh, pick your player, Nolan Arenado hits 350 next year. I want to hit click yes, and then I want to know immediately that it's a 100% chance that he's going to hit 350 next year. You know, I don't want to sit and wait three days for to find that answer. And so number one is it's a ton of data behind these different analytics projects. Number two is our demand to know is immediate. You look at like these big corporations and, you know, they want to know what is our consumer behavior and they don't just want to know it yesterday. They want to know it now. And so what that ends up being is a, a, a single processor or multiple processors. They might be able to handle how much they need to do but they certainly can't handle how much is coming in at that speed and to be able to get a reasonable time frame for our, for consumers. So it almost sounds like the FPGAs or ASICs on the side are doing some sort of data filtering and getting some rudimentary results and that feeds into a central processor? Yeah, and that, that's exactly right right now. Um, but this is where it really gets interesting on the FPGA and and I'm, I'm using FPGA, but there it's you you actually have a little bit of a battle on on which of these technologies is going to win. Um, I my feel is that FPGAs at the end are going to win because you have some very big companies that are looking at FPGAs, um, and you have some other companies that are taking into the limits of FPGAs and making it uh, trying to get rid of those limits. But again, it's I'm using FPGAs here, but it could be any of any of a couple different technologies that win here. Right now, they're being used to offload a little, a very specific tasks, not as specific as what you'd see with a custom ASIC. But again, uh, because programming it is is fairly difficult on the FPGA side, they're being asked to do these specific things. Okay, what and I would t say that the Intel acquisition of Micron is a significant yeah. tell. Of Altera. Of, excuse me, not Micron. That's where you used to work. That's right. Of Altera is a significant tell that at least the big, you know, Intel's known for their massively expensive fabs, right, for their processors. So the fact that Intel would make that type of acquisition is definitely an indicator of, of where the market could go. And, and I think that's a lot of why I have that feeling that ultimately FPGAs win is because Intel does drive a lot of what happens in, in the end with the high-tech industry. 
Um, but just, just to build on the, the final point, what you're going to see over the next five years or so, and again, this is uh, based off a number of different customer visits and things, what you're going to see is the FPGA is going to become more and more smart and, and start to do more and more tasks that potentially you could have seen that the microprocessor would have done. And so now the microprocessor and the FPGA start and you get into true dispersed computing where both of the technologies are working together to be able to get to answers faster. Now, that, that leads perfectly into the next question I had, which is when I think, forget FPGA versus ASIC, when I think FPGA, I just think slow. But you're talking about FPGAs that are, seem to be creeping in on performance to that of a processor. So maybe maybe seems kind of like a stupid question, but wh where do you draw the line between FPGA and you're just offloading to another processor? And point? allow me to refine the question a little bit. I know fast FPGAs as of today are pretty darn expensive. Yep. So... To build on that, you know, like where is that line and how are people making those design decisions? Yeah, so um, each of the design decisions totally up to um, the, the customer. Different people are going to do different things. And a lot of it right now has to do with what tasks they need for the FPGA to do. And so if you look today, yeah, if you look at the most expensive FPGAs out there, they're way too expensive to put into consumer um, types, type um, devices. But if you go and you say, you know, a generation back sort of FPGAs, now those are getting to where they're lower priced and into the same pricing as say a microprocessor. And so if I can, if I can put an FPGA in and have it do um, tasks to, to make my performance better at the same cost of adding in an, another microprocessor, suddenly that becomes an, an interesting trade off for me. And then the other thing that you have is the companies that are doing FPGAs and they're, they're really driven right by Xilinx, Altera and a couple others. They're, they know that their, their highest end is, is really expensive, um, but they're being pushed at the same time by other companies that aren't known for FPGAs, but are designing these big chips to be able to go and offload microprocessors and do more. Um, NVIDIA, Google, Facebook, they've all announced different chips that are, and I'm being really generous here, but they, they're like FPGAs, but they're these massive chips that are designed to be able to go and crunch data. Um, and they do this extremely well. So you have Xilinx and Altera getting huge pressure to be able to go and do things better at, at lower costs. And so that's why I think over the next five years, and again, this is, this is my opinion, over the next five years, what you're gonna see is that FPGA cost is gonna continue to come down and eventually you'll, you'll see it actually become really uh, just a part of a, even a computer system. So a question I have, um... FPGA you know, stands for Field Programmable Gate Array, so it's essentially just a big block of logic gates. Yep. And an ASIC is a essentially also a big set of logic gates. One of them is a you know it has a defined the ASIC has a defined signal path, and there, we know exactly what logic gates are doing what, and there aren't really any superfluous gates in there. Whereas an FPGA just it's kind of the spray and pray, throw as many gates in there as we can at a certain speed, and you know and Where's the? Is there a middle ground there where we're seeing FPGAs put into ASICs or FPGA blocks inside of ASICs? Is that even a thing right now? Uh, it's not. It may be a thing. It's it's not a thing that I'm really familiar with. Okay. Um, you know, the biggest there's a couple different things that drive ASICs uh, compared to FPGAs, and this is really important on say a, like a a server based platform. Because a lot of what you're seeing the FPGAs be put in right now is in data centers and on servers. Because what's happening okay. is the traffic in data centers is really, really big. But the problem with the ASIC is because it's not flexible, because you can't go and, and change it on the fly, uh, there's a, the push is for the FPGAs for that flexibility. Interesting. So right now, do you, so historically, has there been a tradition of servers kind of leading the computing market? in that or is that a new, new trend uh, no the servers have always have I, I by always this may be uh, again a little bit too generous but if you look servers tend to lead um, consumer because what happens is you got these these data centers with just rows and rows and rows of of um of racks of of servers and routers and everything that that's needed there um and the amount of data they're having to push through it, it's always a factor of a hundred more than what you do on your simple PC. That makes sense. And so because of that, servers tend to lead um, what consumers are doing. And so now, and it's actually gotten a little bit worse over the last, uh, worse or better, depending on how you look at it, over the last few years, because now what's going on in data centers is there's this new technology, which is called hyperscaling. Well, hyperscaling, what it does is it says, look, 
before we before we'd have you know you'd have your storage base pl places and we'd go out and we'd do storage you had your servers and we'd go out okay. and do the whatever servers do um, we had routers and they do that well now what's going on is because before you'd waste you know however much percentage of of the space and the capital that you had well our in data centers now everyone's getting smarter and they're saying look i don't want to waste this let's be let's have the servers decide you know to make sure every little piece of utilization is done. And so even more pressure is being put on the server and the processing in the server to be able to make sure all resources are allocated to where these data centers are running at 100% and not 70% of efficiency. Does that make sense? Uh, it was a lot of it talking. Does. That was yeah. A, that was yeah. It was a, it was a bit of a, it was a, it was what I call a burst of. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do they have like a, a server burst. dedicated to computing the optimization of the servers? Like some sort of inception thing going on in the data centers? I'm or? sure they're at the third level of the inception <laughs> at this point. And uh, no, they they do have they have their containers that are going out and figuring out okay who's doing what and where are we doing this and you know it, it's. It really gets down to servers are really expensive for companies. These data centers are really expensive. So how do we utilize the equipment as best as we possibly can? Okay, if we're going to utilize it as best we can, we need to be able to uh, be smart about our resources being used. And so we're going to divide it with these massive supercomputers inside of these servers. Interesting. Well, I was going to say, um, do you see any sort of connection between what we're talking about now and remote dispersed computing. So a classic example might be like SETI at home, but another one I'm thinking is like uh, cars, for example, when they, if, if and when they become mm -hmm. autonomous here in the near future, they're all gonna be communicating with each other. Is there any connection there or is that like a whole different world? Oh no, they, it's all connected because all that data has to go somewhere, right? I mean, you look at, say the cars, right? Well, how are the cars able to communicate with each other? Well, they have to go into a data center or something to be able to go and mine that data. You might have a little bit of point to point, but the reality is that traffic and that data has got to go to different places and it's all going to go into these smart into these smart type data centers. Yeah, I can imagine latency being extremely critical oh, in that application. Yeah, so. latency is a latency is key, right? Is you got to be able to get all this data through as fast as possible and that gets us back to where we were originally which was why in the world are FPGAs? Why are people trying to do more than what the processor can just do? Well, this is this is why those buses like CCIX and why the FPGA things are all why customers are trying to figure out how do I remove latencies? How do I get more data through? Now, one last question uh, before I stop hogging the mic here. Oh, from, you're fine. From you, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have we reached a point where uh, processor technology is kind of leveling off? And is that why? we're forced to create these unique solutions to push more data through a server? Like why, why don't the processors just have a faster uh, clock speed or more lanes? Cores, I guess. Um, we definitely haven't reached where the processors are done. I mean, they have lots of, there's, there's lots of different things that uh, the Intels and AMDs of the world can do to be able to make their processor faster. Um, we've seen where they've leveled off in that they've gone to cores, but the reality is, is consumer demand, especially on the PC, hasn't really been driving for much faster as far as microprocessors goes, right? So um, Intel and, and companies like that, are, are they've hit a point where their processors are doing enough for the consumer, and so with the exception of in the data center. And so what they're doing is they're saying, okay, we have this technology that works well for consumers. Obviously, we're going to try and continue to move it faster, but it's not quite as fast as what it was, say, 10 years ago, where uh, if I bought a processor, I wanted it twice as fast that next year. You don't, you don't have that demand except over in the, in, the, in the data centers. And so rather than having both those technologies divide all the way up, and again, this is just me talking here, uh, they're being smart with FPGAs and things to, to be able to keep the processor and, and where their consumers and data centers are uh, as far as the technologies go. So was the prevalence of multiple cores in a you know, consumer processor, is that a precedent for, and maybe a harbinger, harbinger, harbinger? My wife always tells me how to say that the right way. <laughs> it's good because um, I don't even know what here. that means. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, we're probably going to have to edit that out. Um, <laughs> let me start my question over. So is the uh, prevalence of multiple cores in processors kind of a predecessor of this FPGA you know, movement? I think you could look at it that way, and I'm, when you get into the deep architecture, I'm, I'm clearly not an expert of you know the deep architecture of, of a core processor, or a quad core processor versus a processor in an FPGA. Um, but when you think about the tasks and, and minimalizing tasks off one single processor, 
Uh, it's very, very similar. And, and even if you look at like, say, uh, Intel, they've had this, what they call the QPI bus, uh, which was the bus that talked to between the different uh, cores. Um, that, that bus is now being expanded to go and talk between the different chips outside of the core processor. Interesting. So okay. I, I would say yes, but again, I'm not, I'm not the, the super architect expert there. Fair enough. Um, so let's shift the discussion a little bit to AI, which is clearly you know, where the world is going. And there's definitely part of, you know, this movement demonstrates that AI is becoming more and more important. And normally when I think of AI, I just kind of think of this nice, like helpful assistant that knows things and does things for me. But what does that look like on a more technical scale? Have you ever seen sense? Terminator? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, AI is, it, there's probably, and if you look at technology, there's nothing more debated than artificial intelligence. I mean, it, it literally means I build this big chip and it learns to make itself better and it learns how to do the processing and, and literally is sitting there learning how to do different things. And so um, yeah, it, people are using it today at a very minimalistic uh, way. But if you look at where it's going, and this is, you know, the Terminator reference is funny because uh, in all reality, you, you're talking where artificial intelligence can go. It's not that far out of the realm. And so you, you actually have standards and people looking to make sure that, you know, artificial intelligence doesn't do, doesn't take over the world, if you will, and that we're, we're smart about how we handle our artificial intelligence. There's definitely, we've seen some AI go bad in the last six months or so. A large tech company had their AI bot go on Twitter and try to generate content from Twitter users. And I think we know how that ended and it, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> um, and as a big science fiction fan, I, I think that's something that is not, that debate is not new. And that something like you look at Asimov's laws of robotics is essentially an AI law infrastructure oh, yeah. built around that. Um, so going back, I think I didn't phrase my question very well. Is it, what is it going to take to make AI something that is um, integral to our daily lives? And is that already the case? I, I think you're seeing it that it's somewhat already the case in that, um, you know, let's say Best, Best Buy shelving, right? So they go out and they have a, a number of different products that they put on the shelf. Um, it's intelligence it's the artificial intelligence combined with analytics that says look our consumers are going to buy this many headphones over the next little bit we need to make sure to purchase this much and so yeah to a lesser extent even in our day-to-day -day consumer we see artificial intelligence now on the data center side and getting back to the whole we got to pipe this data through really fast um, artificial intelligence is becoming more and more important because uh, literally these data centers have to learn to figure out okay where Am I seeing a big, huge push of data in and how do I adjust to that? And so over the next few years, for sure, you're going to see artificial intelligence just become a key part of, of our day to day life just through how that how our data is being moved. OK, I'm going to I'm going to spring a question on you. So you made a distinction between artificial intelligence and analytics. Can you explain the difference and why the difference would be significant? I, I don't know that they're necessarily uh, I, I, I make the difference because analytics to me is is understanding trends um, and understanding numbers and being able to make predictive analysis about that. Okay. Um, artificial intelligence, the only reason I make the distinct, distinction, and this could just be a me thing, I, I look at artificial intelligence as not only do I look at the trends and the numbers, but then I put a smarts behind it, right? So, I, and analytics, and, and I'll get back to the election, right? Mm -hmm. if, you look at our, if you look at the analytics piece of, of the election, there was very few analytics based companies that said, hey, uh, Trump's going to win. Right. right. If, if you look strictly at the numbers, but where the artificial intelligence would come in is if someone were out looking at the trends and the polls and looking at all the numbers and then they put in a oh, wait a minute. But America, you know, this broad base America says uh, they're they're looking at Trump. And so I'm going to say that that he's going to win. Mm -hmm. And so. Yeah, there's a, there's a huge analytics piece that goes into artificial intelligence, but artificial intelligence takes it one more level other than just looking at numbers. It puts a, almost a human nature into the data. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So analytics, traditionally, I guess you pull analytics and you know we do this for, for business. You have an MBA, you know, you look at the numbers and you make an informed decision based on those inputs. 
And what you're saying is artificial intelligence will make those decisions instead of a human. Exactly right. Okay. Yeah, and that's uh, and that's where it, that's where you know it has been in science fiction for forever. Um, yeah. You can think about it as Luddite way back in the '70s said, "Hey." Uh, this isn't good, guys. Uh, the, ethic, go the, ethical, the, the, the ethical <laughs> dilemmas that come with the, the future that's in front of us yeah. is, is, I think, personally the most interesting part of it. Absolutely. Because uh, like you said, you have now uh, an, a somebody or something more specifically trying to create human decisions. There, there's morality involved. And Absolutely. That's, this would be an, another great episode. So if yeah. you listeners and viewers <laughs> want to hear that episode, let us know in the comments um, or on our blog. Um, but... We are actually out of time. So that went really, really fast. Part of uh, this, the Double E's Talk Tech podcast is we are asking our guests to provide a prediction about the future. So we're gonna go ahead and do that prediction section. Go ahead, Brig. So here's my prediction. Um, I, I mentioned Luddite. My, my prediction is over the next five years, you're gonna see a major movement into the, uh, a major movement from the people about Luddite movement. So what you're gonna see is all of a sudden artificial intelligence is gonna become more, it, it's gonna become way more visible as to what the Facebooks and Googles of the world are doing with artificial intelligence. And what you're gonna see is a major pushback from the, and I'll use this word very generously again, but the common man is gonna, you're gonna see a major pushback from the common man on what's going on as far as artificial intelligence. So, mm. so look for that. Interesting. Mike, after you. Hmm, I predict that within, uh, t I was going to say 20, I'm thinking more like 30. 30 years, it'll be illegal to drive your own car. Mm, that will actually be really nice, but I'm not going to get on a soapbox. <laughs> hey, I, I, I'm a driving enthusiast. I'm not too happy about it, but let's be honest, it's not particularly safe. I so. picture like <laughs> driver-free zones, and then for people who do autocross like yourself, you can go still drive a little bit. Yeah. But imagine a world with no signal lights, and you could just breeze through an intersection inches away from other cars that are autonomously controlled. I worry about a world where I have to amazing. go 65 and a 65 all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have to do anything. It's the beauty of it. You can take a nap in the back seat. And then, so my prediction is in 2024, we don't have to sit through another election cycle like we did in 2016 because AI will just elect the future robot president for us. I like it. <laughs> The future looks brighter already. Yes, it does. <laughs> so that is all for today for Double E's Talk Tech. Thank you for tuning in. If you have any topics you want us to cover, uh, put them in the comments on our YouTube channel or on our blog. There's a Double E's Talk Tech blog and there's a link in the YouTube description and in the podcast description. You can subscribe to that blog to get updates about when they're coming. You can also subscribe to the YouTube channel and you can see the video portion of it and you will get a notification when those um, episodes hit the air. So from uh, all of us, Brig, thank you so much for coming on today. It was great having you. I'm sure we'll see you back. Uh, I'm Daniel Bogdanoff and Mike Hoffman. And we will see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. Gives me a second to. Remember, you can't spell geek without double E. Mm. That's our unofficial catchphrase. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. I like it. Used on university t shirts everywhere. <laughs> Does this count towards our 30 minutes? <laughs> <laughs>